Hi, my name is Tara Perkins from CPP Investments, and I'm here today with Alan He from FCLT Global, which CPP Investments was one of the founding organizations of, and Viet Hennish from the Wharton School. And the three of us are here to discuss a recent research project that our organizations collectively embarked on to study the value creation potential of organizations investing in their employees. And the resulting paper, which we call The People Factor, uh, describes how employers that not only walk the talk on this front, um, but importantly do it across a variety of different ways. Uh, have better outcomes in terms of certain value creation metrics. So to kick off the conversation, um, Veet, maybe I'll start with you. What did you find most interesting or maybe most surprising about the research? I think it's great to see evidence uh, that when uh, the markets, when investors respond favorably to layoffs, they're really missing the point. Uh, we see too often uh, headline stories and announcements of mass layoffs being viewed positively. Uh, or conversely, news of wage increases being viewed with stock collapses or stock fallbacks. Uh, and what we really want to build the evidentiary base for is that there's a case for investing in our workforce, uh, for making more equitable and just labor practices, and that pays financially in the long term. Uh, so I don't know if it's a surprise, uh, but unfortunately it is. We don't have a lot of large and empirical evidence in favor of that. And I was heartened to see that we were able to show that in this collaboration. I think the paper makes the case well about how investors should be looking at organizations with the mindset when they're thinking about investment of, in employees, uh, the same long-term mindset, which I know you'll appreciate from your organization, Alan, that they would when they look at something like R&D or CapEx. To echo Veet's point from earlier, it's the main fact that investing in your employees really does pay off. We see that overall, in terms of return on invested capital, those that walk the talk outperform those that don't by 4% over three years. And in addition, there are contemporaneous gains to be made as well in terms of ROIC, sales growth, and lower annual turnover on employees. Walking the talk when it comes to employees is really a combination of multiple components. It's not just about raising wages, increasing benefits, improving DEI or workplace health and safety. It's the whole package. So Veet, I think one of the important findings of the paper was that companies that just walk and don't talk don't have the same correlation when it comes to the um, output on value creation on some of the metrics that we studied. Can you tell us a little bit more about the walk and the talk and why it's important to, to do both? What we found that I think is really important in the study is that it's not enough just to be a, a quiet doer, uh, just delivering, but not really presenting yourself to the audience and explaining who you are doesn't deliver the same results. And we think that's because there's a lot of confusion about these relationships. It's hard to know what to measure. It's hard to know what a firm's doing. And it's hard for people to evaluate the firm. And so the way the CEO talks, the way the CEO presents themselves really matters. On the flip side, though, it's not just talk that's enough. Just making nice speeches, just having some nice text in the annual report isn't enough. You also have to deliver to the workforce. What, uh, from your perspective, maybe particularly as it relates to, to the corporate sale and were the other practical implications of the paper? Or what did you make of them? I would say for the companies themselves, it's really important that they execute a long-term employee investment plan while still tending to and addressing those short-term realities. So companies, for example, can do things like inventory, anticipate, and communicate corporate strategies for long-term investments in their employees as a broader part of their corporate strategy. They could track and publish pay equity, uh, employee ownership metrics to show progress over time and its importance to the company, and really highlight the employee voice more so than anything alongside key financial and operational metrics. And Veet, I know in our research findings, we didn't answer all the questions that we started out with, and there's probably room to do some more work. What do you think are the potential areas of future study coming from this? There's a wide range of them. I think uh, you know, we're doing the study in the shadow of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and obviously, some of the relationships we've been studying uh, have been magnified in importance or, or maybe changed. Um, I think there are really some also uh, very interesting differences between the U.S. and the European Union markets. 
uh, that we pick up on in the report. and We highlight how much more important some of these factors are in Europe than in the United States, but that the United States is rapidly changing. I'm curious to see how close we get to the European model. Uh, I imagine we'll never fully converge. There'll always be important differences uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, but how far will we go uh, in increasing the weight placed on labor stakeholders um, uh, within the United States? I think those differences that you're referring to between the American and European findings in particular were one of the biggest surprises to me coming from the research. I know it was, I think, less surprising based on prior conversations with you, based on some of your insights going into the work. Alan and Veet, thank you so much for this time today. The conversation has been a pleasure, and I know that we're looking forward to continuing the collaboration. As we talk. Likewise, thank you, Tara.